okay so let uh, the dean school of physics uh, professor ashok chatterjee uh, begin the meeting by welcoming the guests professor ashok chatterjee over to you uh and mr vice chancellor sir distinguished speaker professor joseph eberly from university of rochester my colleagues and students from school of physics and other schools of the university of hyderabad and other distinguished guests attending this lecture from across the world it's a great pleasure for me to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the school of physics university of hyderabad to the distinguished lecture by professor joseph eberly on quantum entanglement and its classical cousin where are we now professor eberly does not need any introduction to this audience but i think professor antlakshmi will still give a formal introduction to professor eberly for the benefit of our students and the younger faculty working in different areas in physics in our school professor eberly has been working mainly in optics for several decades and is a very well known physicist across the world he has made many discoveries over the years in optical science i would like to mention a couple of them which i find very interesting and also probably i understand them a little better because they have some overlap with the kinds of work that i do in kinetic matter physics the first one i find very interesting and this is actually one of his very early discoveries is a full quantum revival in the james cummings model a very interesting and an important work another work another work uh which another work of professor eberly to which i can relate myself is electron self energy in intense plane wave which he published some 55 years ago in 1966 in this work he independently discovered in electrodynamics though implicitly the phenomenon of higgs mechanism that is how masses massless particles can acquire mass through interaction this is a phenomenon which is somewhat similar to meissner effect in superconductivity that's why it is so interesting to me in 2003 professor eberly discovered the phenomenon of crystallization in time for the highly excited states of atoms which is analogous with the anomalous improvement of conductivity with temperature in condo effect by coherent heating in condensed matter physics some of the other important works of professor eberly include electron mass shift in electromagnetic radiation super radiance one dimensional model atom with soften singularity theory of non sequential ionization counter intuitive excitation of multi level systems arbitrary control of a quantum electromagnetic field polaritonic solitons in multi level media the list is actually very long i'll not take much time on this but before i end i would like to welcome professor eberly again and would also like to thank him profusely for being kind enough to accept our invitation to deliver this distinguished lecture in our university and share with us the present status of quantum entanglement and broaden our horizon thank you okay um i would like to you know extend 
on what Professor Ashok Chatterjee has said and introduced Professor Eberly. Uh, it is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be here to introduce an eminent scientist like Professor Eberly to this audience. Uh, Professor Eberly has done his undergraduate from University of Pennsylvania and PhD from Stanford University in 1962, working with Professor E.T. Jaynes of the Jaynes Cummings model fame. And his PhD thesis was on the black body distribution law in semi-classical radiation theory. Subsequently, he joined the Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Rochester in 1967, and has remained there ever since. And currently, he is serving there as the Andrew Carnegie Chair Professor of Physics. To put things in perspective, Department of Physics and Astronomy and the University of Rochester is well known to many Indian physicists because it was the PhD location and long-time faculty base for the very famous Indian scientist, ECG Sudarshan, who visited our university for an extended period of time and visited later on any number of times. Another interesting historical point, which is relevant to us at the School of Physics, is that the founding of our School of Physics in Hyderabad is a direct consequence of the appointment of Professor Girish Saran Agarwal, who is another PhD graduate in physics from the Rochester University, a good friend of Professor Eberle. We all know that Professor Agarwal took his appointment as initial dean of physics at HCU many decades ago. The next few lines, which I'm going to say now, is to enlighten many of the students who are sitting here. Professor Eberle's seminal contribution to the field of quantum optics is the book on optical resonance and two-level atoms together with L. Allen. It has launched many a career in quantum optics and has trained generation after generation of researchers me included, and many of the people in the audience who also have been beneficiaries of the, this book. Uh, this is not to mention his other great books on lasers and uh, laser physics with P.W. Miloni, which are textbooks followed for laser physics all over the world. Uh, other notable contributions of Professor Eberly include the article on quantum optics in the Encyclopedia of Science and Technology and a chapter on coherent transients in the APS Handbook of Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics with C.R. Stroud, Jr. He has written more than 500 research papers and reviews with more than 30,000 citations. He has produced several PhD students, and some of the names you will recognize immediately include Peter Knight from Imperial College and P.W. Miloni, the co-author of the books on lasers which you have already mentioned. Now, I will now move on to mention some of the awards and honors Professor Eberly is a recipient of. Professor Eberly is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Optical Society of America. He has been the chair of the American Physical Society Division of Laser Science, founding editor of the first ever online journal, Optics Express. And he was the president of the Optical Society of America and he was the chair of the OSA Presidential Advisor, Advisory Committee. He has served as a member of the APS Council, the AAP <laughs> Governing Board, okay. a member of the Advisory Okay, Board, Annette. So okay, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Some of the, let me continue, Professor Everly. <laughs> Some of the awards and with which Professor Everly received are GILA Visiting Fellowship in 1979, Senior Alexander von Humboldt Award in 1984, Distinguished Alumnus Award of the Penn State College of Science, the Smolichowski Medal of the Physical Society of Poland in 1987, the Charles Hart Towns Award of the Optical Society of America in 1994, the Georgian Award for Creative Innovation in <laughs> Undergraduate Tech Teaching. Stop, stop, stop. Sister, go, go, come on, Anatta. <laughs> the Federal Times Medal of OSA in 2010. Uh, Professor Eberly, and he has, uh, uh, you know, he has other distinctions. Professor Eberly is uh, asking me to tone down, so I will take go move on to the next topic, which is to mention some of his research interests. Though Dr. Ash Professor Ashok Chidraji has already talked about most of them, just for the sake of completeness, I would go ahead anyway. Professor Eberly's research interests are in the general field of uh, theoretical quantum optics, quantum information, atomic, molecular, and optical science. Uh, his recent results from his group include the co-discovery of a new quantum entanglement effect called the sudden death uh, 
um, incidentally, Professor Everly has coined this word sudden death himself. And uh, other, uh, uh, you know, other uh, fields in which he worked include the derivation of area theorems which govern the non-local effects in coupled optical pulses and the prediction of new phenomena in high field double ionization of atoms on which uh, Professor Ashok Chatterjee has already elaborated. Some of these first are the following. Uh, his group has predicted um, the spontaneous revival effects in the wave function of a single atom in a cavity. And his, the first, they, they were the first to identify the efficient counterintuitive excitation method. I can go on and on and on, but uh, I think we should leave sufficient time for Professor Eberly to deliver his lecture. Today he is going to talk to us um, about his research in quantum slash classical entanglement and its uh, consequences and ramifications. And now, before Professor Eberly begins the lecture, uh, our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Appar of Podile, will, uh, you know, preside over and make a few remarks. Professor Appar of Podile, over to you. Good evening from uh, to the viewers from in India and good morning uh, uh, to Professor Aberly. I at the outset let me thank uh, Professor Aberly for accepting our request to deliver this distinguished lecture uh, for the benefit of the <coughs> participants from University of Hyderabad, particularly the uh, faculty and students from School of Physics. Uh, Professor Aberly, you may be aware that this university is uh, a, a relatively young university, about 47 years old now, and, uh, and a small university also in the country. And the University of Hyderabad, uh, although is young and small, has reached a, a status, a coveted status called Institution of Eminence, in the last uh, a couple of years ago, we have been conferred with this uh, institution of eminent status, which makes us, or which takes us to the top 10 institutions in the country out of, uh, that is 1% of the institutions in the country. And uh, among the 12 schools of study that we have, School of Physics has been the uh, one which was there from the beginning and has done exceptionally well over the last four decades, and with several outstanding scientists, outstanding faculty working at School of Physics. And uh, we figure in the global ranking in terms of subject-wise, uh, both also physics, chemistry, and uh, English and life sciences, we figure in the global top rankings uh, uh, that speaks about uh, the contributions of the School of Physics. And my colleagues at School of Physics, both the faculty and students have been doing a variety of uh, uh, um, uh, working on variety of topics and made some significant contributions, which I'm sure some of them you may be aware of. And they were taking, I don't want to take too much time because I want you to speak more to the uh, participants. And uh, it's, uh, uh, although we are all worried and concerned about this pandemic, this is one thing, one thing which we have, uh, gained out of this uh, pandemic is to take advantage of uh, these online meetings and then take uh, help of the distinguished scholars across the world without uh, have, without troubling the uh, distinguished speaker to travel all the way uh, to deliver the talk from one place to all the way to the India. This is one advantage I consider and this is one advantage for our students and faculty to have the benefit of having you as a distinguished lecture speaker for today. And uh, after listening to the uh, scientific contributions that you, uh, oh, the pioneering contributions that you have made uh, as observed by Dr. Ashok Chatterjee, who has been the Dean of the School of the School and Anant Lakshmi has been reading continuously about uh, the outstanding achievements that you have. And I don't want to uh, delay the lecture by uh, any more, therefore, with these initial remarks, I would like to request you to uh, go on to deliver your talk, and I'm sure all of us are keen to listen to that. Professor Aberly. Thank you. Thank you. 
I, I'll begin by sharing my screen and then we can proceed, I think, in that way. Yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak with all of you today, and I'm embarrassed by all of the extra information that was provided about, about my career. That's, that's uh, quite nice, but wasn't really necessary. Let, let me proceed now with the topics that I'd like to talk about, getting high on entanglement, we can see uh, what that amounts to. And in order to go forward, uh, let me see, I need to go um, 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 now, what's, let's see, it says I'm sharing. Yes, new share. Why are we not? Uh, Professor Eberly, your arrow screen should work. Sorry? Your keyboard should work, arrow keyboards. I, yes, I'm, <clears throat> no, he's, he's not I, <laughs> I'm working on my keyboard, but somehow it's not, it's, all right, let me try a different approach. Okay, this, this seems to work all right. And it brings us to the beginning and it begins with a question. Where does entanglement start? And there's a nice illustration here of what's intended to be the boundary zone. You can see the boundary zone between what is classical and what is quantum mechanical. And across the boundary, you can already see Schrodinger's cat. Uh, what, what we will do is try to occupy a little bit of both sides of this boundary. So let me proceed. Um, here, here is a picture of, well, across the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, two different forms of entanglement, one, one very conventional and uh, common, simply wrapped up uh, ropes, and then a classical figure on the bottom right, the uh, Greek uh, person, Laocoon, uh, struggling with serpents, entangling him uh, with his sons. The person responsible for the term entanglement in physics is shown there, that's Schrodinger. And of course, right next to Schrodinger is his famous cat. Now, we need, we need to start a little bit with the cat because this picture of the cat introduces an important issue that will come up again and again. And as it says, uh, the story of Schrodinger's cat engages a superposition of possible realities. The most famous possible reality that everyone knows is that the cat might be alive and the cat might be dead, but there are other superpositions shown in this uh, nice graphic uh, listed on the right-hand side. In case you're not familiar, uh, there is a radioactive atom and Geiger counter on the wall and it's able to activate the switch. The switch, when the switch drops, then the hammer drops and you can see the hammer and it has smashed a vial of poison. And that's eventually then what uh, kills one of the cats. The other superposition is still in good shape. So we'll have to deal with situations of that kind, uh, but more, uh, physically oriented, I think, to get to some of the points that are important. Now, one, one really wants to know, uh, what about superposition? What does that mean? <laughs> and I encourage you not to think in terms of superstition. We're not talking about superstition, but about superpositions. And there's a kind of warning that I've written here. Um, Books often imply what is written there, that what is called wave mechanics 
is the same thing as quantum mechanics. And these books are often written that way to make it easier for students and instructors. But in truth, uh, wave mechanics is mainly optics applied to a particle wave and probability gets thrown into the picture. Uh, this makes it seem different and difficult. Unfortunately, most students and even some professors think that wave mechanics is 100% of quantum mechanics and, and that's not the case. Now, we'll, I'll, I'll try to clarify some of that by saying uh, what a book should assert uh, that quantum mechanics starts with duality. And that's, that's the difficult point from the very beginning. How can a particle be just a wave or how could a wave turn into a particle? But this, this is the heart of a quantum object that it can be treated as a wave and particle at the same time. Now, I, I mentioned here these, these particular words that will turn out to be important and they're often not emphasized that a quantum object can be treated as a wave and a particle at the same time. Now, the first person to write a well-known and very uh, expert book on quantum mechanics was Dirac himself. And he dealt with this issue in his chapter one by showing a picture of an interferometer as is shown here, Mach Zender interferometer, in which a photon is shown coming in from the left and if you're familiar with this instrument, you know that uh, the input uh, can be transmitted through that mirror or can be reflected down and transmitted on the second uh, level. But then mirrors are arranged so that those two paths are combined again. And the outcome then uh, turns out to be the photon that entered. But, but that outcome and the consequences of the outcome can be explained only by treating the photon as if it ran on both tracks in the interferometer. And I want to emphasize those words also, treating the photon as if it ran on both tracks in the interferometer. This, this language is important and this language is frequently overlooked or forgotten. Now on, on page eight in Dirac's book, the photon is said to be in a superposed state, in a superposition state, just, just like two combined waves. But here's the point. At the moment the photon is detected, the photon, as Dirac says, the photon must change suddenly from being partly in one beam and partly in the other to being entirely in one. The word being here is another important word. This process is often referred to as a collapse of the wave packet, that the wave function that is describing what's happening to that photon has undergone a sudden, spontaneous, and uh, unprovoked uh, collapse of itself so that it reports at the very end that the photon comes out whole. Then another famous quote from Dirac that one likes to remember is the following one. Each photon interferes only with itself. Interference between two different photons never occurs. Okay, I start with these historical remarks because they're still widely quoted, they're still widely understood but they're also widely misunderstood. And I'll return to this at the end, but what we would say about both of Dirac's remarks would be different today. And we would think carefully about such a word as being. You remember I, I highlighted being up here at the top, that the photon changes from being partly in one beam and partly in the other to being entirely in one. So that, that provides a little bit of quasi-philosophical background that eventually enters almost every serious discussion about quantum properties and quantum particles and, and quantum processes. What we want to know about entanglement is that it's a combination. 
This is one thing that makes it fascinating, makes it important, makes it useful, is that it combines both of these impossibly connected aspects, particle and wave. <clears throat> and since, <clears throat> excuse me, since the combination that makes a superposition uh, can be done with one particle for entanglement, at least two particles are needed. And this is because we want to mix up identity with interference. We want to mix those two and in this way, we'll get an inseparable superposition state. So that's what's written here, as if it was talking about polarization, where the letters V and H can simply be read as vertical and horizontal, vertical and horizontally polarized light beams. In the first bracket, we can identify particle A from particle B by the label. And that's a local thing. But we need to combine that with another bracket that also engages the same two particles, A and B, but in this case, engages them differently. So look again at the first bracket. You can see that particle A is identified as vertically polarized, particle B as horizontally polarized. And the second bracket contradicts that and says that particle A, in fact, is horizontally polarized and particle B is vertically polarized. So that contradiction between the two brackets, which are added together to make the total state, means that the state engages a contradiction from the very beginning. The state is also entangled, and this is something for those who are not familiar with the terminology or what the term means is that in this superposition, it's not possible to write that as a single bracket that would contain only a symbol for A and a symbol for B. So that if I were to eliminate one of those two brackets, then what remains is a separable state. That is to say, these two parts of the state can be factored apart from each other. As soon as this extra component is included, that can't be done. And that's what makes this state non-factorable. Non-factorable is the same as inseparable, and that's the same as entangled. Now, here's something also that's semi-philosophical. Does it matter? Does it matter who is being referred to as being unable to separate or factor? That is, if, you, if we say this superposition is inseparable, who's not able to do that? Then this leads to another question, which we'll get to by the end. Is there classical entanglement? Not really. But yes, really, as we'll see. And, and this, this is a subject that, uh, as, as we'll see, is rather straightforward and obvious, but <laughs> interestingly is still confrontational and leads to arguments. So let's go a little bit further. There are two types of entanglement of two objects, A and B. Uh, one engages the objects by means, by dis describing them by means of continuous functions, functions of position of A and position of B. And if this function is an entanglement of A and B, it means that that function can't be written, cannot be written as a product of two functions, one engaging only A, the other one engaging only B. The same thing is true for discrete matrix vectors. A sum of superpositions cannot be written as a product, one involving A, the other one only B. Continuous entanglement arises when the domains of the two particles are remote from each other. Discrete entanglement arises in what are called qubit contexts. And those of you who know anything about information theory know, of course, what a bit is. 
an, a unit of information and Q-U-B-I-T, quantum bit, qubit, one says for quantum bit, uh, is, is a situation that arises for discrete entanglements where we can count the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so again, finishing, is there classical entanglement? Not really, meaning many people say no, but yes, really, and, and we'll see how easy it is to be sure of that. Now back to polarizations of photons, vertical or horizontal polarizations of photons. You may have heard of so-called quantum states that are called Bell states. Bell states are written here in terms of polarizations. There are actually four Bell states. All of them are entangled and take a look and you'll begin to be comfortable with the idea of entanglement that in, the, in this first row, there are two Bell states, depending on whether you use the plus or the minus sign in between. And the second, and you, you can see the impossibility, the, the contradictory character of the superposition. In the first case, photon A is said to be vertically polarized, but in the second case, it said, no, no, it's horizontally polarized and opposite for B. In the second Bell state, the second pair of Bell states, again, there's a contradiction between the first bracket and the second bracket. First case, both A and B horizontally polarized. In the second bracket, it says, no, no, they're both vertically polarized. But the point is that we have superpositions of those. So we have to take into account, and here's an important note that will go throughout what we'll talk about today, First of all, that these entangled states are superpositions of contradictory information. That's hard to keep in mind, that that's important, that contradictory information must be engaged. Now, what makes it more complicated and what leads to problems for students always is that quantum states, and these brackets are indicating quantum states for us, quantum states contain only probabilities. So that this contradictory information is not only contradictory, but it's uncertain, right? That's, that's, what, a pol that's what a probability is. It's an amount of uncertain information. How can any of that contradictory and uncertainty lead to anything? Well, we have to explore that a bit. And here's a little exercise for anybody who is watching the screen. Here is a, this box is itself a visual superposition of contradictory information. What does it mean contradictory? As it says there, can you handle the visual information here? When you look at that box, which box face appears to you to be in front and which box face appears to be in back? If you look at it steadily, almost everybody will be able to see this box while you're watching flip between two different views in which the box is facing. I'm looking at it now so that I see the box opening down to the left but now it has flipped for me. Now the, the side that was in the back has now jumped out to the front and the box is opening up to the right. So these two are contradictory views, contradictory information coming from the same image. Now here's a tough one. You see two of these, two boxes, just like the first one. And if you look at them, and look at them often enough, long enough, so that they flip, you can ask yourself, do they flip together? And now, here, two sides of each box have been painted, and you can see that the left-hand box now is open up to the right. The right-hand box is open down to the left, 
And the two boxes are clearly the same kind of box, but we get a different view of each of them. And I wonder if your brain can handle both of these views. I'll let these be here just for another moment or two. Look at this and see if you're registering the right-hand box. I suspect that you're not registering the left-hand box or vice versa, that your brain has a very hard time telling you what the left-hand box is doing if it's focused on the right-hand box, because these are arranged to provide contradictory viewpoints of the box opening. Well, now we have to jump to quantum mechanics, and I've written a picture here that most physicists will recognize as uh, three energy levels of an atom, the three crossbars there in black, we would take to be the levels of energy of an atom. And those levels are labeled, you can see with little brackets, little a, little b, and little c. But connecting those levels are two horizontal lines labeled with capital letters, capital A, capital B, capital A, capital B. And we can use this as a visual indication of a particular process where photons can excite the upper level from the lower level. And that's, that's why the slanted lines representing photons are connecting levels in that way. Now, the way in which such a state would be, such a situation would be represented uh, is given uh, at, at the bottom so that you can see that it is a superposition Let's see if we can get that. Oh, all right, almost. That was good enough, I think. So you can see a superposition on the, well, that doesn't help really. There's a superposition on the left side. Uh, three terms are added together. So here's, here's a plus sign and here's another plus sign. So that the first combination of brackets, the first combination, well, you get the idea. The first combination is added to the second combination and that's added to the third combination. And notice that all of those, con none of those components are the same, that they contradict each other. The first component here says that photon I'll call capital letters photon, photon A with some probability plus two times the probability for photon B is combined with level A for the atom. But no, that's added, that's superposed to a different combination in which the amplitude of probability associated with Photon A is now double what it was in the first case. In photon B, it's only half what it was in the first place. And they say here it's connected to level B, not to level A. Similarly, the next, the next combination is also engaging both photons, but engaging yet the third atomic level. So these combinations that are added together are all contradictory in, in the sense that they're all presenting different information. That means that this is going to be an entangled state. And now we have to ask ourselves, to what degree, to what degree is it separable? That means not entangled. To what degree could we write this as a product of only capital letter brackets multiplied by a combination of lowercase letter brackets. So the capitals be separated completely all together, multiplying a combination just of lowercase letters all together. Can that be done? And that's a way to test how much entanglement have you got? So let's take a look. This is a procedure for advanced students. It's called the Schmidt analysis. Now what Schrodinger knew, Schrodinger was a very smart guy. What Schrodinger knew 
was a famous theorem on nonlinear integral equations by Erhard Schmidt, uh, David Hilbert's principal collaborator, when they were working out a uh, continuous function analysis around 1900. Schmidt has a theorem that is now extremely valuable in information theory and, and step one, step two, step three, four, five. I'm sure you've all memorized those by now, right? Um, it, is the sequence that you go through to find an analysis, a particular analysis of one of those states. What you end up with is the state that is able to be written, I'll take that away. It's able to be written as a summation, here's the summation, over a bunch of other states that each are identified individually with A for atom and F for field or photon, but there's a large number of them. And we have to sum over all of those possibilities. So, but Schmidt tells you how to do this in a very systematic way. And you can see, well, what is not seen is that the lambdas, the lambdas have to sum up to be one. That's how the probability is contained in this wave function. And if one of those lambdas for a given n value is itself equal to one, then all the others have to be zero. And if that would be the case, there would only be a single term in the summation. And if there's only a single term, then there's direct factorability. The A atom bracket is just multiplying only a single one of the F photon or field brackets, then that's separable and there's no entanglement at all. In that case, there's a measure that's called the Schmidt weight and the Schmidt weight would in that case simply give the value one, meaning there's only one term in that whole summation which could be infinitely long. There's only one term and when there's only one term, then it's clear that the bracket that belongs to the atom and the bracket that belongs to the photon, there's only one of each of those that matter and they simply multiply each other so they can be factored. They sit there in factored form. Uh, Bell states have uh, a factorability equal to two, meaning that there are two states engaged. We already saw that. Well, here's, here's the way in which the lambdas in a particular example well, in the example that's written below, the, the lambdas turn out to be, one of them is almost as big as one, the other two are very small. And so the K value is given by a formula that comes from Schmidt that, that Schrodinger knew about. So Schrodinger knew about this work due to Schmidt that was probably published when Schrodinger was in high school but he knew it and he remembered it and he remembered that that was a way to quantify what he then labeled entanglement. So that's how we got entanglement. That's how we got this method of organizing entanglement. And I just mentioned here that in the case that the states are continuously entangled, continuously described in terms of a continuous variable like the position X, then the Schmidt advantage is that it will permit you to make this continuous distribution that you can think of as an integration over a whole domain into just a summation over a series of points. There might be an infinite number, but nevertheless, it's only points. It's not a continuous distribution. That can be quite helpful sometimes. And when we have mixed states, physicists will know what mixed states refer to, not pure states anymore. If we have a mixed state entanglement of A and B, then that can be measured by a, an entanglement measure called concurrence. And it's important to remark, if you haven't heard this before, to know that remarkably little is still known, still now. Remarkably little is known about entanglement of more than two particles more than two could be entangled together. In that case, 
there is a concurrent qubit theorem that says what's listed here in the middle, that the concurrence between A and B squared, concurrence between A and C squared, has to be less than the concurrence of A with B and C considered together. Now, I don't know if you remember, but there's a triangle connection here. Those two C squareds obey a relationship that is true for the lengths of sides of triangles, right? Two sides and a third side have to obey this. And we've, with, with the student, we, we've been able to make use of that triangle relationship among concurrences in, in a very simple way. But the nice thing is that we've been able to get a first measure, a first way to measure tripartite, three-party, genuine, multi-party entanglement. This has been a tricky issue for, for several decades, and I, I think we've cracked it now. Well, okay, that's, that's a side comment. I want to jump now to a different story that you'll see is related. A new tale of two old vector spaces. Now those quantum states that I was talking about, one can identify as vectors in a mathematical sense, vectors, because they can be superposed in the way those sums and differences of states have shown. But we have, of course, other vectors that are sometimes more familiar. And if we turn to quantum optics, quantum in a quote here, or in parentheses, with a question mark, what's going to be quantum about this? Because I'm talking here about a classical beam-like field, a field that is propagating here to the right. The electric field is characterizing the light field as it goes. And as you know, these light fields are transversely polarized. There's an X component and a Y component, both perpendicular to the Z direction of propagation. And it means that the entire electric field is just a sum of both. So, th so the electric field needs both of those components. So here's the X component, here's the Y component, and you see that I've attached unit vectors, X on the first case, Y on the second case, to take account of the fact that the field itself is a vector. The field has a direction that prints, that points confusingly in some situations, confusingly perpendicular to the direction. The light field is moving to the right, but the electric vector that is producing the light while it moves to the right is actually itself pointing to the side to the X direction a little bit and to the Y direction a little bit as it moves along. Now these components are measurable, measurable by means of four stochastic correlations. There would be four such correlations here where the subscripts I and J are either X and Y or XX or YY or XY so that there are four of those that get engaged. What's the point of this? Well, the point is that a light field can, on some circumstances, be non-transverse. For example, the light field on the interior of a black body cavity, the field could point in any direction inside. That means it's not a beam, that's all, it's not a beam. But it also means that one needs three dimensions for the field components, X, Y, and Z, now all are going to be engaged. And the products of the field's components, there will be nine of them, X with X, X with Y, Y with X, and so on, all the way to X with Z, and give rise to, as these graphs show, 
polarizations that can point in any of three directions, not just in two directions that are transverse. So it raised an issue that became highly controversial among classical optical physicists, how to find the degree of beam polarization. How much polarized is it? When you have only two components, then George Stokes, the guy who basically founded the science of polarization for light, found that if you analyzed and identified separately the unpolarized part of the field and separately the polarized part, and you added together the degree of polarization for the two, you would get the degree of beam polarization. But it turns out it doesn't work when you have three possible directions. And there was a big controversy and some people that I went to lunch with in Rochester were engaged in this controversy, so I got interested in it and began to think about it a little bit. And here's, here's what occurred to me, that classical light needs two vector spaces, not just two vectors, but two different spaces in which the vectors occupy. One of them, I simply call laboratory space, and that's, that's the vector space associated with the, well, I can't focus, can't get the X and Y. It's, it's the space that points, in the 2D case, it points to the sides of the beam, to the X side or to the Y side. But that's completely different, of course, from the functions that are being directed to the X or to the Y. And they also live in a vector space. This is a stochastic function space, also a linear space. And so in this way, it occurred to me right away that a light field is an analog of a two-party quantum state. And the analog is, is attempted to be shown here just below. The top line below the red, the top line shows the electric field vector itself being composed of a vector from lab space, namely this X with a hat on it, times a component that is a vector in function space. But notice that it's added to a contradictory thing. It says, no, the vector lab space is in the Y direction and the component in function space is this other function, E sub Y, not E sub X. So here we have a superposition of the kind that we've been talking about all along. A sum, a com combination of contradictory components. In addition to that, we know that the two component in the lab space are orthogonal, X is perpendicular to Y, but the components themselves here, the components uh, can be measured in terms of their overlap correlation. They need to have no particular relation with each other. That's simply some number that can be measured. But if I look at a quantum state next, here, if I can highlight, no, I can't highlight that. Um, the psi referring to particles alpha and beta have two different components that are contradicted by the summation that is being made. We understand that two of those unit vectors may be orthogonal and the other two may not. So this is, means that the electric field, the electric light field, entirely classical, has a very nice analog in quantum physics. And the components, the vector components in the quantum state have analogs in the classical state. If we just learn to think about the classical field as existing in two different vector spaces at the same time. So that's back to the top here. Two vector spaces are needed 
every vector light field requires to have a direction given with the unit vectors off to the side and an amount of electric field contained in that direction. Okay, this is interesting and can be quite useful. Why is it quite useful? Well, we, we can see by the analog that the classical vector spaces might be separable. It might be possible if we make one of these Schmidt uh, analyses, we might be able to find, well, I can't do that somehow, but in the last equation, you can see that the field is written simply as a product of a lab space vector, hat with a U, times a function space function, M, that's a function of the location R and the time T of the field that is propagating. Now, if you look at that, you would be able to see immediately, I think, that the spaces are separable. They simply multiply one. There's no superposition anymore. They simply multiply a vector in the lab space times a component that is a vector in the function space. Immediately, one knows that that's not going to be entangled. That's exactly what one has when one has non-entangled, fully separable parts of two different vector spaces. And the result, uh, when, when one thinks about that, uh, here's, here's a little slide that just shows how you would do the Schmidt decomposition of the electric field as opposed to the quantum state. And here's just to remember, a reminder that we saw an exact quantum analog and we studied what to do with the combination that's just like this combination now over here on the right, a combination that's a completely classical electric field, but it's composed also of a pair of an addition of contradictory informations. The first component says that the field is polarized pointing in the X direction with an amplitude called E sub X. But the second component says, no, no, it says it's pointing in the Y direction with another amplitude E sub Y. So we're superposing contradictory information again, and we know how to deal with that with the Schmidt process. So the Schmidt process under appropriate conditions can well deliver the situation we saw in the previous slide where all of the lab space condenses into a single lab vector and all of the function space condenses into a single function and they simply multiply each other. So what, what we can conclude very quickly is that perfectly polarized, this is perfectly polarized. The field definitely points in just one direction. But while being perfectly polarized, it's perfectly separable. You can exactly separate those two vector spaces from each other. And what have we got here? The takeaway result is that we have an example. What, have we, what example have we got? We have an example of what's clearly Classical entanglement. This is exactly what entanglement is, or what the lack of entanglement is, when we have vector spaces that are exactly composed in the way that we see all parts of one multiply all parts together of the other without any superposition. So here's classical entanglement produced directly, no problem. Okay, now we're, we're getting on toward the end here, and I want to return to Schrodinger's cat uh, at the end and to re-examine the original picture in terms of superpositions. If we were to write what happens or were to write our viewpoint about the cat in a quantum way, we would write it as is shown here, two different alternative possibilities. The cat's alive or the cat is dead. Those mathematical prefixes, one over square root of two, just 
ensures that this is a proper quantum state, that it's normalized to one. Now, what about the other superpositions that are in the cat? Well, how about the Geiger counter monitoring a decaying atom? Well, the decaying atom here, the decaying atom can be either originally in its excited state or after it decays, the atom is in its ground state. But in advance of anything happening, while we're waiting, we don't know because it's in the box here. We don't know, is it in its excited state or is it in its, in its ground state? The superposition, once it is realized that the de-excitation has happened and the radioactive nucleus has decayed and has sent a signal to the apparatus that allows the hammer to drop, breaks the vial, releases the poison, and that then determines that the cat is dead. So the state for the atom and the state the state for the atom determines then that the cat will be originally in a situation where it's partly alive and partly dead. Now, what does it mean? Think about it. This is really the point at the end. What does it mean that the cat is partly alive and partly dead? It doesn't, doesn't really mean that at all. It, it's only talking about what we know. What do we know? We only know that it might be alive and it might be dead. And that's the way these superpositions are written. This is entangled with the atom that is about to decay, because it means that one thing that we know is shown here, that the atom is still excited. That's what this E stands for. The atom is still excited. And so the cat is still alive. But it's also possible that the opposite is true that the atom has now decayed to its ground state, which means it has emitted the signal that has allowed the hammer to drop and leads the cat to be dead. So that these two combinations are the combinations that are contradictory, but they're contradictory only to us, only to our thoughts about what's happening. So that contradiction lives with us and we can't assign it to the cat, it's ours. Now, the famous Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics deals with this issue, and I think deals with this issue in an old fashioned way. Um, it, it ignores, well, let's say what, it, what it's talking about. The con Copenhagen interpretation says that there's a simultaneous existence of the cat being alive and the cat being dead. There's no way that that's true, but what is true that it's simultaneously unknown by us whether the cat's alive or dead. Simultaneously, we can take both possibilities into account. The Copenhagen interpretation says that that remains, <clears throat> the simultaneous existence, remains until a detection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this raises a question that is very infrequently taken account of. Who, who owns this wave function? Who owns this wave function? Huh. Nobody thinks about that. Well, some people think about that, but not very many, and not very many books deal with this. Who's in charge of the information? Because it's only the person who's in charge of the information 
who can react to a detection. Detection only, in fact, only affects somebody who has this information in mind. Now you would say, well, wait a minute. What about somebody else has some different idea in mind? Okay, let them have some different idea in mind. There can be many, many wave functions for the cat, depending on how many people there are thinking about the cat. Because these wave functions are only mental probabilities. They're only mental probabilities. And you're not going to change your mental probability until you get more information. If you learn about a detection and it shows, oh, the cat in the box, look, the cat in the box is in good shape, then immediately you know that your wave function was wrong and it should show the cat being alive. This, this business is given the funny name wave packet collapse, meaning that the wave function has suddenly changed and it has become an alive cat, whereas previously it was alive plus dead. Well, it didn't have anything to do with the collapse or anything to do with the cat. It had to do with the fact that you learned something about the cat and so you changed your wave function. What about somebody who happened to go out for a beer and hasn't learned this yet about the detection. Well, in his mind or her mind, there's still a superposition of the cat being alive and dead. Well, does it mean the cat is alive and dead? No, of course not. It just means that that's what the person who has the wave function in mind is assigning probabilities to the cat in which one state or the other state. So wave, wave packet collapse, you will frequently read about, even in the textbook that I'm forced to use to teach my freshman students this term, there's a whole chapter dealing with wave packet collapse. And I have to work very hard to persuade my students that this is nonsense. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's just nonsense. The, Wave packet collapse doesn't affect the cat at all. It doesn't affect quantum states at all. It simply affects, it's a property of your own information. So the statement here that's identified with the Copenhagen interpretation, a quantum system does not possess physical properties that exist independent of observation. Now, that's misleading as well. It should say a quantum state, or you can say a quantum wave function, does not possess physical properties that exist independent of observation. It just possesses information about physical properties, physical properties that exist independent of observation. You can think about this in regard to the famous question, is, is the moon there if nobody looks at it? Well, this is a little bit of technical closing up here uh, about a su superposition state and the way in which different real physical states are interpreted in terms of quantum language. So here's an atom state and the atom state is interpreted in terms of these pictures that I drew earlier in which the atom is either still excited or the atom has decayed and in its, its ground state. This is interpreted in quantum language in a way we're all familiar with, that the state is simply some combination in this way, a contradictory combination of being excited with some probability indicated by alpha or now in its ground state with some probability given by beta. So this superposition of contradictory information is what makes up this particular atom state containing the uncertainties that we have. Simply, we don't know which is which. Similarly, for the cat state, for the cat state, the cat can be alive or the cat can be dead. In our mind, in building a quantum state, when we don't have different information. Well, th this, 
this goes to the heart of interpretations that one can find to read about. The, the point uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning is that the matter of entanglement is the part of quantum mechanics that, that can be most confusing to students trying to learn about the meaning of combinations of contradictory information. But at the same time, it's the most fascinating part of quantum mechanics for fictional writers who love to have the idea to explore absolutely impossible situations that they can create as possible in their exotic novels. Well, okay, that, that goes a long way through the whole topic of entanglement and the way in which information is stored. Here's a bit of technical information we don't need to pay too much attention to. This is a little more interesting and you can ask this, uh, what is entangled? What can be entangled? And there are physical systems here that are, that are listed that we've talked about. Uh, atoms, physical system, obviously, uh, photons, light beams, physical system, certainly. An electron is certainly a physical system. A nucleus, certainly a physical system. And these physical systems all have attributes that we deal with quantum mechanically by assigning brackets that identify for us the possibilities that exist in this case for an atom. I've drawn an atom as if it has lots of energy levels. Each level is a possible one for the atom so each atom, each level can be represented by a different bracket, one, two, three, up to N. In the case of photons, we've used polarization to indicate attributes, horizontal or vertical. In the case of an electron, we can talk about spin. I haven't mentioned spin, but it's the same thing as polarization. Spin up, spin down are the two possibilities. And we call these state vectors, vectors in uh, objects in vector spaces. And here it indicates that a vector space, also called a linear space, just a collection of vectors, mathematical topic, mathematical name for what's going on. And the important thing is that they can be added together. They can be multiplied by numbers. And this is the way in which superpositions are created and superpositions of, of kinds that we've talked about here would be one a wave function associated or a state vector, one can say, associated with particles A and B, contains this contradictory information about their polarization. In one case, particle A is horizontally polarized while B is horizontally polarized as well. But no, no, particle A is vertically polarized. Particle B also vertically polarized. So they're the superposition of impossibilities it's an impossible combination, only possible to write in terms of a wave function because a wave function is only probabilistic information. That's all it is, only probabilistic information. And where does probabilistic information live? Only in your brain, right? Only in your brain. And what is wave function collapse? That's when you change your mind, when you realize that the wave function you were thinking about wasn't quite right now that you know that the cat is alive in the box. Then your wave function cannot be a superposition anymore. It has to be simply a product that shows that the cat is alive. That's all there is to collapse. That means collapse is basically nothing. So the idea that we have come to is a return to Dirac again. The photon is in a superposed state. He says that, and that's correct. Except that now we have to realize that what we mean is that our assignment of probabilities about the photon, 
our assignment is in a superposed state. That's the way we write our assignment about the existence of the photon. We write it in that way. It doesn't actually mean that the cat is both alive and dead or that the photon is both horizontally and vertically polarized. Then Dirac goes on to say, the photon must change suddenly, talking about the interferometer, the photon must change suddenly from being partly in one beam and partly in the other to being entirely in one beam. Well, what does being mean? Being means what you're thinking about in the wave function. Being means the way you have decided the wave function is appropriate for a photon going through a Moxdender interferometer. And you allow for the fact that it might be in one beam, it might be in the other beam. These are your probabilistic possibilities for the photon. So that then when the photon arrives at the end, one would say, well, I can no longer agree that it's partly in one and partly in the other because it has emerged and I've detected it. So that's all the collapse of the wave packet is. It means that your view of the wave function has now changed. How quickly can you change your mind? That's how quickly the wave packet can collapse. Now, last of all, in Dirac's most famous quote, each photon interferes only with itself. Interference between two different photons never occurs. And we would certainly say that differently now because we realize that an entangled state is a state of two photons and it is directly interfering with itself because the wave function that we've written contains a contradictory combination. So in these contradictory combinations of entanglement, Dirac, you would have to say, uh, spoke a little to fast. I say here at the bottom that we would say both of Dirac's, we would say both of Dirac's remarks differently, certainly about interference of a photon with another rather than only with itself. And we want to think very, very carefully about using such a word as being, right? What does it mean for the photon to be? When we only have probabilistic information, it's hard to be confident that what we're talking about is accurately described as being one thing or being another thing. These probability elements are really hard to keep in mind and lead to hasty remarks that don't really have any quantum uh, validity. So here's the final note, just saying it all over again. Entangled states, entangled states are superpositions of contradictory information. There aren't superpositions of physical realities. There aren't superpositions of dead cats and alive cats. There are superpositions of information about cats. And, and finally, the first remark and last remark is that quantum states contain only probabilities, meaning what's a probability? A probability is uncertain information. It's something you're not certain about. And that's all quantum states ever give you. And you might, and you might take away a final remark that is highly inflammatory after all, Schrodinger's equation is only theory. Schrodinger's equation is only theory. Is it ultimately exactly perfectly right? Who knows? For a long time, Newton's laws were thought to be absolutely accurately correct. And of course, we know they're not now. And probably the same thing will be true for Schrodinger's equation. But in the meantime, it's the best thing we've got. And 
It's full of confusing elements. And again, look at this last slide. States can be superpositions of contradictory information without contradicting anything about physical reality. And that's because quantum states contain only probabilities, meaning they contain only uncertain information. Okay, here's the right time to quit. I thank everybody for your attention. I've been to India a lot of times. I always enjoy a visit to India. This is the first time I've visited India while being in Rochester. Thanks for your attention. Professor Everly, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. And there are a few comments, and you know, in the chat box, let us look at the comments. Probably it's best if I read them out because, yeah. Uh, I hope there are no really tough questions. Can we read that? Professor Everly, there are a lot of. Uh, uh, Appreciation. Appreciation from the audience. Professor Pathak says, entanglement being presented in a simple language. Thank you, Professor Eberly. And uh, Professor Bhatnagar is, uh, has a similar comment saying, you know, it's a very interesting talk and he has learned a few things about entanglement and he thanks you for the lecture. And uh, let us see more. Some some student who has a great session. Anyway, there are a lot of praises and no questions, but Professor Eberly, I would like to, maybe I'll, at the cost of sounding... Can, 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 I, can I ask a question? To explain please. to me a little bit more. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead, Ashok. Professor Eberly, can, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have uh, one question about entanglement uh, entropy. She's muted. Uh, entanglement entropy if i have a number of particles is it ashok is it? am i audible i'm i'm able to hear you okay so if i have a number of particles which are non interacting and okay. if i want to calculate the entanglement entropy which essentially means the number of accessible states so how, uh, I mean, the, how, in what way that will tell me about the, let's say, uh, conductivity or something like that? Um, let's see. The, the, the answer is, uh, the answer is very complicated, of course, in, in, in a true complicated situation. The, the first thing that comes to mind uh, that one has to be aware of is that uh, entanglement arises uh, only from uh, interaction. So the particles that have never interacted with each other cannot be entangled. Okay, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about that, I think. We're talking about a situation where particles have in the past uh, undergone interactions of some some kind. Now, uh, one, one can introduce uh, situations that specify the result of past interactions. Uh, one common situation of that kind is to specify a bath or a reservoir. And, and there are rather common uh, quantum mechanical representations of uh, baths. And, and we know, of course, of the thermal uh, density matrix, E to the minus beta H. Uh, and then I have to know the Hamiltonian in order to find uh, what the state is for the particle. 
Now, the, the given situation, of course, will then have to determine what Hamiltonian am I talking about. And the Hamiltonian then will contain uh, the interactions that are present in the particles that we're concerned with. And what I know about situations of that kind is that almost every Hamiltonian that you could write down that would be moderately real will produce uh, an impossible situation to calculate with. So that uh, approximations and simplifications have to be introduced at that stage. Now, I, I don't know if that can possibly be an answer to your question or not. Uh, yeah, to some extent, I was thinking of, I mean, how conductivity is connected with the maximization of one of maximization of entanglement entropy. I was thinking of if the number of states is large, probably the conductivity will be large because the particles will have larger states available. Um, a, a possible example is the example of uh, free electrons in a box. Uh, free electrons non-interacting in a box, we know cannot all occupy the ground level because of the Pauli mm -hmm. exclusion principle. And so they, they occupy higher and higher and higher energies until we get all of the electrons. And then that's what we call the Fermi level, where they have all come up to the top. Now, what what is the mobility associated with that collection of electrons, because the mobility will then determine what's the conductivity of the material we're talking about. We know that the electrons that are near the bottom uh, have nowhere to go because the upper levels uh, above them are already filled. So it's only, only the electrons, the few electrons that are near the very top of the Fermi level that actually can be excited and can be caused to move uh, in the wire or whatever material we're talking about and, and actually give, give rise to a current. So a conductivity would have to take into account, for example, the temperature will tell uh, what range of energies at the top of the Fermi stack of energies, what range of energies will be excited uh, for the electrons that are near to the top. So within, within the amount of energy, basically uh, inverse KT, uh, we, or KT for the energy will be the, will tell you how many electrons near the top will be available. And of course then an important, uh, maybe the most important constituent for conductivity is to know what's the density of electrons that actually are free to do a movement. Now, uh, to, to, ask, to ask then about the quantum state, uh, to ask about the degree of entanglement among those electrons, uh, they have to avoid each other, of course, being Fermi. And this typically will induce, induce some entanglement among them. In, in the same way, for example, that the Schlater determinant for the electrons in an atom is, is an entangled state. So, so something like that, I think, is probably the, the answer to your question. Uh, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to dodge the question, really, and not, not, <laughs> not, not, find, and not solve Schrodinger's equation right now. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Professor Eberle, there are a few questions for you in the chat box. Professor Eberle. What should I do? Look in the chat box? Yeah, or you can, or I can read it for you if you would like oh, yeah, to. I, okay, I, I know I see them. Yes. Uh, is there any connection between entanglement, sudden death, and collapse of the wave function? And... Uh, I would say the answer to that is yes. And the connection, I believe, uh, to be strictly 
uh, strictly cautious. I believe that that connection in in a pure form is is still unknown. That is to say, what what I do know uh, from my own work on entanglement, sudden death, is that there is there is still no way known to predict the timing for the sudden death, to analyze the input state in a sufficiently fine way that the so-called onset of sudden death can be timed accurately. That's, that's not been possible to do so far. So I, I hope that's at least partially an answer. Um, another question is to comment on weak measurement and quantum measurement. And um, the, the thing I believe to keep in mind about weak measurement without deeply engaging the theory uh, is that weak measurement depends essentially on both an initial condition and a final condition for the state that is being examined. That is the uh, information about final state as well as information about initial state is part of the component of weak measurement as a kind of quantum measurement. And I think maybe that's about all I should say just now. That's, that's not a very good answer, but that's the best I can do right now. Um, let me let me ask, uh, let me look at another question that, that says, uh, the idea of classical superposition and classical measurement procedures, is the idea of classical superposition and classical measurement procedures that create the classical entanglement? Um, I would say that's getting close to heart, the heart of the matter. Um, if, if you have a classical situation, uh, let, let me say how to, how to bring this a little closer to, to what we've been talking about. Uh, if in a classical situation, you have yourself in a position where you have only probabilities to deal with. You have no certain knowledge. A physical example of that that's close to one of the uh, topics that I did deal with has to do with the polarization of sunlight. Now, everybody I think knows that sunlight is unpolarized that if you have a little Polaroid and you put it in a sunbeam and you rotate the Polaroid, the intensity that passes the Polaroid is unchanged. You cannot dim or brighten the amount of beam passing through a Polaroid sunlight beam by rotating it. So that the way in which one could get classical entanglement would be to first polarize in X direction and Y direction a beam or to divide a sunbeam into two beams and polarize one in the X direction, one in the Y direction, and then run those two beams together into a fiber. Now in the fiber, you would have a combination of X polarization and Y polarization traveling together, you would be able to describe them only probabilistically because you didn't have enough control over the creation of the polarization states in the first place. That would lead to classical entanglement. That's a procedure that would create classical entanglement for you. And there wouldn't be anything quantum mechanical about the process at all. You could say, but wait, 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 aren't those photons? Aren't the photons? Well, now, how are we describing? And that reaches a very interesting question that nobody knows the answer to. Now, anybody who is 
listening who wants to make uh, a contribution to uh, theoretical physics, let's say uh, tomorrow or, or maybe next week, um, invent, invent a definition of classical light. Invent a definition of classical light. It's not widely understood, but when you think about it, I believe you'll agree it's obvious. We all agree to begin with that light is quantum mechanical, that we describe light quantum mechanically. All descriptions of light that are based on quantum theory are verified by experiment. There are no errors ever found. Light is a quantum mechanical process. But now wait, what kind of light did Thomas Young use? What kind of light did Heinrich Hertz use? What kind of light did Fraunhofer use? Were those guys doing quantum experiments without knowing it? What was light like before 1900? Before there was Planck, was there still light? Could we now say, let there have been quantum light? And, and then we could say, well, even, even the light that Thomas Young used for his two-slit experiment that must have been quantum light, but we always think of that as completely classical. So what's the definition? What's a proper definition for classical light? I don't think you can find that in Wikipedia or in any other reliable source. Um, now, okay, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a kind of rant. So, so if I, I'm just giving you an opportunity to become famous now, to become famous, invent a definition for classical light. You cannot say, let me tell you an answer that will not do. You cannot say, well, that's just a coherent state. A coherent state is completely quantum mechanical. That is not classical light. You could say, what about the photon statistics? Well, all of, the, all of the light that was used classically, all of that light was thermal light, right? All of that light was thermal light. So that maybe thermal light is classical light. That's as close as I can get, but I haven't published that. So, so I, I promise not to publish anything about this until next week, Friday. So, so you have a whole week now to get in ahead of me if you have a better idea. Okay, quick. Now to another chat here. It says a beam with a transverse profile has a longitudinal component. That's right. That's, that's of course, opposite to transverse. Do I always need to use 3D coherency matrix? Do I always need to use 3D coherency matrix? For broad beams, can I reduce it to two by two with some corrections, not separating polarization from the mode functions? Do I retain the full information about the transverse Bellinfante spin? Now, now I know a little bit about Bellinfante, but I, I forget about Bellinfante spin. So let me try to answer independent of that. I would say that when you're, when you're doing some theoretical work, then, then you're in control. Right? If you're doing experimental work, you're not in control. The apparatus is in control. But when you're doing theoretical work, you, you're in control. You're typing on the computer or you're writing on a paper or something. So you're in control. So you're in charge of making a model. That's what theoretical physics is about. It's about making models, models that agree, that correspond, that cohere to some physical situation in such a close way that people that read about your model won't simply laugh, but they'll agree, oh, that looks good. But it's only a model. So it's the theorist's idea of what's going on. So that would come to my mind if I'm dealing with 
light beams that are wide or not wide, beams that have transverse profiles or don't, beams that are confined in a beam context or beams or, or light that is not even in a beam. So an example like that, for example, is the, is the light field at the focus of one of these very high power lasers that's being used to do uh, nuclear fusion projects and so on, uh, ionizing tritium and isotopes of helium and so on in small cavities. In those cavities, there's no particular beam direction, but there's certainly a lot of electric field. And so one could analyze such an electric field taking into account all three components. How you would know to create amplitudes for the three components, well, you'd have to know a lot more about than I do about the way the beam works, about the way the laser focus works. So that, that's, that's a rather poor, incomplete answer. I'm sorry about that. Is, is uh, Anantha, I, I must ask, uh, if, if my answers are so poor, um, does, does, it, does, it mean, does it mean that my honorarium will be canceled? <laughs> no, because it will be. <laughs> <laughs> The honorarium is independent of the answers you give. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Everly, last time you contributed that honorarium to the students of physics when you came to India. This uh, Professor Dathivutta here. So you donated that thing for our students last time. <laughs> Don't worry about the honorarium. <laughs> Professor Everly, there are more questions for you in the chat box. Oh, there are? Oh. Where is it? Here's the chat box. Uh, let's see. No, my, ch my chat box does not have any more. Let us uh, post it to you, you know, we'll, we'll post it from the YouTube to you. One second. Where is Tata's question? My question is... Okay. Professor Eberle, it is just to you, not to everybody. The, oh. He sent you a direct message, so you will see. What, in, in the chat box? Yes. I know Professor, I don't think me, you can read out the question. That is that way easier, okay? Sure. You can simply read out the question. The question is, interference of light... Is it correct to say single photon interferes with itself, but not with another photon? That is Professor Tata's question. You have, you know, already talked about this in your talk, but Professor Tata wants you to clarify on this point. The question is, interference Why? of light, is it correct to say single photon interferes, interferes with itself, but not with another photon? This is his no, question. I, I, I can't catch that from your speaking. Ask, who, whose question is this? Yeah, uh, can I? Yeah, oh good, 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 good. That's good, just ask, go ahead. Yeah, when you, because you said in, uh, in when you are talking about a photon interference with itself. If I say only a single photon, because I'm confused with a two-slit experiment with respect to incoherent light, the, the way we are introduced interference. So if I consider only a single photon source, okay, is it to observe interference? Can I observe with a single photon source with wide slit? Okay, um, can can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I, I would say that I, I would try to give Dirac's answer to that question. And I think that he would say that his the example that he showed of the Moxender interferometer. Wait a minute. Where, where is Anantha? Go away. I, I want to I want to talk to the questioner. Anantha, you have taken the screen. No, I have not. You have taken the screen. You can just start sharing the screen. You just press share screen. Is it Tata? 
Yeah. Please share the screen. Me? Yeah, you want to talk to you. Ah, bravo, bravo, good. Okay. So I, I continue my answer by, by trying to give Dirac's answer, which was to interpret what he was saying as meaning that the Moxender interferometer is in its operation the interference of the one photon that was injected with itself. Mm. Mm. And, and you, you can understand from my earlier comments that I would interpret that uh, interference with itself as interference of your information about the photon. Mm. That that's, that's what's interfering. Okay. Oh, are you? Now, oh. But bring yourself back to the screen. You've you've gone away from the screen again. No, I'm I'm I don't know. Yeah. I'm not touching that there, there all the time. I I think it, Anantha is playing games with us. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yes, stop yeah. stop doing that. This this <laughs> was, this was it was a good My question. second question. Just quickly, second question. Sure. Yes. Yeah. When you say entanglement. Do you how do you define a strength of entanglement or quantifying it like very oh. strong entanglement, weak entanglement? What I'm unable to catch any slide to define the quantum of entanglement or strength. Or I, I that's, don't know, I'm clear. that's an excellent question that I I almost I almost avoided completely. There yeah. there was one there was one slide where I introduced the concurrence. Uh, I, I introduced a set of six instructions for the advanced student. And, and at the end of the instructions, one of the results of the instructions is that you come up with an entanglement measure called capital K. Mm. So capital K is the degree of entanglement. And that, that number is strongly controlled by the number of states that were in number of components that were engaged in the original state. Mm -hmm. And that that number K can't be larger, can't be larger than the original number of states. Mm -hmm. So if I have a state, if my original state is a continuum state, that means there are an infinite number of components. Okay. And an entanglement then has no limit. Oh, okay. The, the one... This, this raises another question that I forgot to mention that I could say now, and that is that there are many different measures for entanglement, and the Schmidt measure, what is called the Schmidt weight, capital K, is just one of those measures. All measures of entanglement, all measures of, of entanglement must agree at the value zero. All measures must give zero when entanglement is absent. Okay. But but there's no there's no connection among the different measures regarding how big they could get. And does it mean that when there's no entanglement, basically the degree is one? Because in the log yeah. scale it becomes one, zero. That's right. That yeah, that's right. It means there's there's in effect there is only one state. There's no superposition anymore. Yeah. That's a good point. So the scale defines between one and infinity. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in, in the okay. in the Schmidt measure, uh, entanglement absent of entanglement means k equals one. Most most measures would put zero for that number, so that oh. in that way people usually write k minus one. Oh, okay. To be degree of entanglement. Yeah. Thanks for that remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, did you pass, post them to you? Mm. Professor Eberly, there are a few more comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, I see a bunch of others. Let's see. All right, let me look. Well, I, I like Ashok's remark about using some ideas to teach about quantum information. Mm. All right. 
a, a wonder for homework problem on Schmidt decomposition. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't actually give the quote of the Nature paper where Schrodinger introduced his cat in English. There's a paper in German that is a good bit longer where the cat is introduced, but there is a paper in English also in 1935, the very first year published in English in Nature. And when you look that up, it's published in the Cam Cambridge Mathematical Transactions, I believe. Uh, when you look that up, you'll see that one of the references in Schrodinger's discussion of entanglement is to a book, uh, a book uh, by, uh, who is it, and Hilbert, somebody in Hilbert, Courant. Courant and Hilbert had a book on mathematical methods of physics that was very popular and very, very widely cited from the 1920s until the 1960s, at least. And Schrodinger mentions the page number in the Courant Hilbert book, where you should look. And if you look on that page number in that book, you'll find the Schmidt theorem very carefully worked out. And this, this, is, this is a very nice reference because Schmidt is a guy famous for other things about uh, analytic function theory, but this is one that can be taught in any kind of undergraduate, let's say advanced, but still undergraduate quantum mechanics course, the Schmidt theorem can be taught because it's relatively simple. And the, the Schmidt theorem is what underlies uh, all of this analysis. It's basically summarized in those six steps that I wrote for advanced students. But the Schmidt theorem Schrodinger knew probably from high school. As I said, Schrodinger was a very smart guy. And by 1935, he had already invented the Schrodinger equation, of course, about 10 years earlier, so that he was familiar with what Schrodinger theory would be able to do and how the Schmidt theorem could play a role. It's, it's a nice thing to look back and read. Well, let's see, there might be, there might be other comments. Okay, yes, analogies between interference and alive dead and so on. I, I think that's, that's a smart observation. Um, another thing from, uh, is it like, number one, in our mind, we perceive an interference pattern when we don't know the path information, or two, in our mind, we don't perceive the interference pattern when we know the path information. Well, that's an interesting comment that I don't know how to answer just at the moment. That would require a bit of thinking, ha, 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 about interference patterns and information. Um, I, I would say that that's probably correct. If one is interpreting in, interference pattern in a correct way. Interesting. Okay, so I, I'll think a bit more about that. I, I think, I think uh, Anantha, you, you could even, I, I'm answering so many chats here. You, you could probably double my honorarium, right? Sure, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll certainly do that. And uh, this uh, comment which uh, uh, Anirban Devnath made, isn't it something akin to Welsherweg problem? Ain't here. Hmm? Okay. He's looking at other chats, I think. There's no more things on the YouTube. Ah, one second. There's one more. Oh my God. 
Professor Eberle, I think yeah. uh, we have more or less uh, exhausted the comments and uh, questions in the chat box. And uh, well, it it exhausts it exhausts me too, uh, Anatta. Uh, I I I think you should triple my honorarium. We will do that. We will do that. I will <laughs> I will make an application to the authorities and uh, get it sorted <laughs> out. Surely. Well, <laughs> three. Three times zero is not very tough. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this quite a lot. Actually, you know, the comment which uh, Anit Band has made, uh, when you do not have the information about the path, then you talk of interference. And when you know the path, then you do not imagine your mind interference. Isn't it something that uh, Welsher Weg, uh, which uh, was discussed, which was talked about a lot uh, in many contexts, isn't that uh, similar to that? The no, see, uh, I, I'd like to make a comment in this context. Uh, when you know the path, it's a classical uh, physics, actually. Uh, but when you don't know the path, basically, uh, you know, the probability from going from one point to another you know, you know, all paths have to be considered, and that's the Feynman path integral formula. Right, right. So that's uh -huh. another way of looking at quantum mechanics. I'd put that way. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I hope, I hope that that's just a wise comment. That that wasn't a question, was it? A question was something to do with interference in mind. Uh, that's a very difficult question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there, there, there are there are situations where the path <laughs> integral formulation is is very well suited. <laughs> Professor Eberle, I think uh, we have more or less exhausted the you know questions, and you must be really exhausted. Probably we'll uh, you know close with your permission. We will close it. But before that, my colleague Ashok. Uh, would propose a vote of thanks. And uh, before he proposes a vote of thanks, thank you very much, Professor Everly, for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, I will be in touch let, with you. Let, let, us, let us thank Professor Everly in a formal way. That's very nice. Thank you. And uh, Professor Everly, Ashok would like, now Ashok Udaygiri will propose vote of, vote of thanks. I will sit there and wait. Uh, so that mic can catch, and uh, although you cannot see me, um, sorry, it's okay. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Professor Eberly for this very elucidative talk, yeah. where he made yeah. a lot of complex things very simple. Thank you. And, uh, uh, thank you. On behalf of all the people who have been on the Zoom meeting and also those who have been listening to us on uh, YouTube, the world over, uh, the technology has made it wonderful that people are sitting at different places and listening to us. So on behalf of all of them, I thank once again Professor Eberly uh, for this wonderful talk and also for the very uh, interactive discussions that we have had. Um, then uh, we thank uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Apparau and also Dean School of Physics Professor Ashok Chatterjee. Uh, for extending all their support and uh, being with us and making this whole thing reality. And uh, the, our Office of the Public Relations Office, uh, Ashish Thomas, and all his personnel who, and who worked behind the scenes, and also the computer science, uh, computer network facility, uh, Mr. Sanjay Sharma and his entire team who have all been working behind, behind the scene. Secretary to Dean of School of Physics. Uh, without all their work behind the scene, this would not have been possible. So thanks once again to all those people who are behind and working silently, but made this possible. And then the audience uh, who have been here with us patiently, uh, although we had a few glitches and then we got back on our feet and uh, you, 
you all forgave us for all those things. I presume you have forgiven us. And uh, you have, and I also saw some very nice comments, people who have thanked us and who have also thanked uh, Professor Abeli for the talk, which we are passing it on. And thank you, audience, uh, who have been with us. And uh, once again, uh, participation and inquiry and uh, all the audience who have been sitting around. Some of the audience who are across the globe on the other side of the world uh, and without without whom the lecture is not complete. I mean, we can just talk to the computer with no, not knowing who are all listening, but we are keeping track of how many of you are there and who are listening. Uh, thank you one and all once again. Uh, it was a very, it was nice, a wonderful pleasure to listen to this talk and it's pleasure, I'm sure it's pleasure for you and it's pleasure for us that you have been with us. Thank you once again. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Professor Eberly, once again, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Now, Professor Eberly, thank you so much for giving such a wonderful, such a wonderful talk. I, I, I enjoyed all of it. I enjoyed all of it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for good questions too. Um, India all is people wonderful. who are on the Zoom meeting, can you switch on your video for a second? I'll just take a screen.